Hi, my name is Thomas Hope. I'm a radiologist and nuclear medicine physician at the University of California, San Francisco. And I'm honored to be given the opportunity to talk here at LACNETS about uh, imaging of neuroendocrine tumors and PRRT. So let's get started. These are my disclosures, which are relevant in some respects, but uh, you can go back and take a screen capture of them if you want. Let's just review, you know, when you think about being a neuroendocrine tumor patient, you come through radiology as a patient in so many different ways, right? So the top left there is a CT scanner. Right now we have an issue with availability of iodinated contrast. In the top right, you have an MRI, uh, which is loud, makes a lot of noise, is claustrophobic because it's really remarkable images of certain organs in the body, particularly the liver. The bottom left is a PET scanner, uh, PET CT in that case, which we can use uh, to image uh, somatostatin receptor radiopharmaceuticals which we'll talk about in a bit, also FDG PET. And the bottom right is a SPEC CT, uh, which is actually used to image a lutetium after we've treated patients with PRRT, and we'll talk about that as well. And I think sometimes it just gets confusing just because of the large number of imaging modalities that we use together to actually tell how to best treat patients moving forward throughout their care. Now, for this talk, I'm going to focus really on two things. The first is SSTR PET or somatostatin receptor PET imaging and PRT or peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. So in terms of talking about SSTR PET, these are the images, right? It works really well. So on the left there is something we call a MIP or a maximum intensity projection image. This is, you can see the patient's head at the top, arms are up in this case. Uh, the black circle there is surrounding a nodal metastasis near some surgical clips uh, on the axial images there on the right where there's a little bit of recurrent uh, somatostatin receptor positive uh, neuroendocrine tumor nodal disease. Uh, and you can clearly see that with, without somatostatin receptor pet, you'd really have no way to localize this disease disease. On CT, a little three to four millimeter node would be very nonspecific and, and you'd have no way of telling that that's cancer. But now you know where the disease is and you can follow that node using CT scans over time to see if it grows. So we can localize it and then choose the right imaging modality to follow it over time. Now, what is SSTR PET? So it's based on a somatostatin analog. So I think most patients are very familiar with somatostatin analogs. That includes uh, lanreotide and sandostatin. These are injectable somatostatin analogs that are used to prevent hormonal related symptoms as well as progression in patients who have a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. But you can also take these somatostatin analogs and attach it to a chelator. That's there in the red dashed box. That chelator, I think of as a glove, is just going to grab hold of some type of radioactivity. And in the case of SSTR PET, it's holding on to gallium-68 or copper-64. These are radio metals that decay by giving off a positron that we image using PET-CT, right? And so we, in essence, are imaging where the somatostatin analog goes within the body. So the somatostatin analog, shockingly, it binds to the somatostatin receptor, and that is convenient conveniently overexpressed on neuroendocrine tumor cells. So the somatostatin analog binds to the somatostatin receptor on neuroendocrine tumor cells, gets endocytosed or brought inside the tumor cell, and then the radioactivity decays from inside of the tumor cell, allowing us to use that PET scanner to image where the radioactivity is in the body. There's actually now a lot of approved somatostatin receptor PET agents uh, in the United States. When I started doing this, uh, none of these were available, and we were trying to get gallium dodatoc available to our patients. But now we have three different agents. One is gallium-68 dodatate. This was approved back in 2016. Gallium-68 dodatoc was approved in 2019. These are very similar agents, in essence, identical to one another. Uh, but gallium dodatoc was approved at the University of Iowa, and there's no widespread availability of dodatoc yet, although companies are working on making a kit available for that agent, and soon, hopefully, dodatoc will be more widely available. And then the third one most recently approved is copper-64 dodatate. Uh, this is a slightly different agent because it's radio-labeled with copper rather than with gallium. It was approved in 2020, and it's actually maybe one of the most widely used imaging agents in the market. And one of the reasons for that is the copper itself. Copper is produced in a cyclotron and you can produce large quantities of copper uh, and it has a 12 hour half-life so you can ship it around the country. So in the United States, this is primarily made in uh, St. Louis, Missouri and delivered to places around the country. Because of that 12 hour half-life, you don't have to worry about the timing of the imaging study so it's much easier to schedule. Uh, gallium 68 is generator produced. You can only make you know, two doses maximum per synthesis. So each generator really is only used to make one dose per patient, which really makes it hard to schedule and coordinate things. And for this reason, copper has become much more widely used. And there's been sort of a switch over to copper from gallium. 
Now, when you think about them comparatively, here's a patient image with both gallium and copper, and there's really no diagnostic difference between these two imaging studies. You still see the somatostatin receptor PET avid lesions. You can still characterize small lesions. For example, that spinal metastasis on the right side, the right column there shows a sub-centimeter spinal metastasis. And the dosimetry is fairly equivalent between these two agents. So I think of them as being very interchangeable. Uh, a lot of patients have questions about this, but in essence, if you go from one to the other, there might be a slight difference uh, on the margin of being able to see some disease better with one versus the other. And actually, interestingly enough, uh, the disease or the agent that seems to see disease better is copper, uh, even though it's a little noisier. So you can see in the top right image there on the gallium 68 dototoc, the background images are less noisy. The copper is a little more noisy, but you see the uptake in the lesions a little better. Although there are some patients where you might have a little bit of difference versus one or the other. In general, again, I would think of these as interchangeable and not be worried about whether or not you got image with copper or gallium. The other question that oftentimes comes up is this effect of somatostatin analogs before imaging with somatostatin receptor PET. So here was a study that was published now three years ago. Time does seem to fly in COVID times. This study, in essence, took patients and injected them with their first dose of lanreotide and imaged them with dotatate PET before or immediately after the injection of the lanreotide. And here you can see that the change in uptake is very minimal, if anything, between patients who were imaged immediately after a lanreotide injection, after, immediately after is one day later, or before. And so although you know, for a long period of time we were very strict about timing your dotatate PET right before your next SSA injection, we've become a little more loose here. And you know, I'm fine if patients wait a week after uh, with lanreotide and probably two weeks with sandostat in terms of the timing of SSAs relative uh, to somatostatin receptor PET. And if anything, you look on the left there, the tumors are actually hotter uh, if you're imaged after lanreotide versus before. So if anything, it actually makes imaging easier uh, and better if you inject lanreotide before. Uh, sort of a change of our practice in the last couple of years. Okay, another comment about FDG PET, and I put here Dota XXX, uh, which would be Dota Talk, Dota Tate, uh, the different somatostatin receptor PET agents. And in general, not always true on in an individual patient, but in general, patients who have higher grade tumor, higher KI67s, KI67s over 20, will have higher FDG uptake and lower somatostatin receptor PET uptake. So the higher your somatostatin receptor PET uptake, the better behaved tumor normally is, the slower progressing it is, the more likely it is to respond to cold octreotide. Uh, the ones that are lower uptake with higher FTG uptake are going to be slightly more aggressive. PRT will be less effective, uh, and those patients will progress more quickly. Now, in some patients, and particularly patients who have well-differentiated G3 pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors or other G3 nets, the use of dotatate PET and FDG PET can be helpful to look for heterogeneous disease. So in this patient, you can see there's a black arrow pointing to a lesion that's somatostatin receptor positive, but FDG negative. And there's other lesions in the same patient that are more FDG positive and somatostatin receptor negative. And this is important in some patients because it's the FDG positive disease that's going to drive the treatment decisions for patients. And so it's important sometimes for a clinician to say, hey, that lesion is the one that's FDG avid. Maybe I want to do liver-directed therapy, for example, to treat that lesion. Whereas the uh, somatostatin receptor positive disease, we would treat with PRT and allows to be a little more patient-specific in the way we approach the treatment of patients individually. Another comment about imaging, and I always like to make this comment, is that repeating somatostatin receptor PET imaging studies over and over and over again can sometimes not be helpful. So here's a patient who was imaged with an FDG PET, and then at three different time points with a dotatate PET. And you can see it's hard to tell if those lesions in the liver are growing or not. And oftentimes, somatostatin receptor PET studies are done with a non-contrast CT, where you can't see any of the lesions in the liver. And so it's very hard to have figured out if this patient's actually progressing. And I make this point because because patients think that you need to get SSTR PETs for accurate staging of patients. And actually, oftentimes, uh, conventional imaging, when I say conventional imaging, I usually mean CT or MRI, is the best way to tell if patient's disease is growing. So for in this patient, the best way to stage uh, the patient would have been using hepatobiliary phase MRI over time to see if the, in the lesions in the liver are growing, if that makes sense. So I just want to make sure that we, a lot of times we get overly focused on somatostatin receptor PET. Please try not to do that and realize that MR and CT are really beneficial in patients. So now we will take a change and track over to PRT and talk for a quick couple seconds about PRT. 
So we have this term theranostics, and that's the idea of using the same compound for both diagnosis and therapy. So we take this exact same construct I talked about in the first half of the talk, the somatostatin analog attached to this chelator. And in that chelator, as I said, you could put an imaging radionuclide like gallium-68 or copper-64. But you can also put other radionuclides such as lutetium, yttrium-90, actinium-225. These can be used to treat patients. And this is what PRT is. P is the peptide, the somatostatin an analog that binds to the R, the receptor, the somatostatin receptor on the tumor cell surfaces. It goes inside the cell and carries with it the second R, the radionuclide, the lutetium-177, and that lutetium decays inside of the tumor cell, giving off a beta particle or an electron. That electron causes DNA damage. That DNA damage leads to cell death and does T or the therapy, so peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. Now, that was studied in the Netter-1 trial. This was a phase three study that compared lutetium-177 dotatate to double-dose sandostatin. That's the control arm, uh, getting two injections of sandostatin every month versus lutetium dotatate. In the Netter-1 trial, this slide here shows improvement in progression-free survival, which was markedly improved with lutetium dotatate. And it was performed in progressive mid-gut nets, which is important because there's a lot of trials looking outside of mid-gut nets. But this set the standard treatment modality as 200 millicuries given four times every eight weeks. And this is what we do uh, in our practice and around the country. Everyone gives four cycles, 200 millicuries every eight weeks. And there are a number of trials evaluating PRT in different clinical settings and with different agents. For example, the COMPETE and COMPOSE trial are using lutetium dotatoc versus lutetium dotatate, and they're comparing it to everolimus in the COMPETE trial and G1 and G2 gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. The COMPOSE trial is in a slightly higher uh, grade population, a G3, G4 two population and comparing it to chemotherapy or everolimus. Uh, this is somewhat similar to the Netter 2 trial, which is actually moving up front earlier, so prior to somatostatin analog progression in the higher grade G2, G3 gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but the comparator in that study is high dose octreotide. And then there's two cooperative group trials of note. One is a alliance trial in bronchial neuroendocrine tumors compared to everolimus, and another is a another alliance trial in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors comparing to Cape Cytobine, temozolomide. So it'll be very interesting to see how these read out. Now, when we do PRRT, we give the same dose to every patient. So here's four different patients with widely different biodistributions, uptake, uh, et cetera, and yet each one of these patients gets treated exactly the same. And although we don't know how to treat them in a personalized way yet, hopefully in the future, we will start thinking about how we optimize dose individually for each of these patients to get optimal treatment response. Now, you can actually image patients after every cycle, and at UCSF we do this. So you can see here's a patient with their pretreatment dotatate PET, and then there's four cycles. So after cycle one, two, three, and four, we can image where the disease is. In this patient, you can see, for example, the liver lesion responding, having decreased uptake, and then there's progressive increased uptake in the kidneys and the spleen because there's decrease in volume. Now, this is helpful for us to evaluate dynamic changes in patients to make treatment decisions, but also you can think about how you might want to use this in terms of evaluating tumor response. So here's someone who measured the dose to tumors in gray, so don't worry too much about the units, but the idea here is that there's a wide variability of tumor-absorbed dose, and maybe we want to optimize the amount of dose that goes to those tumors by changing the amount of administered activity. So one way to think about this, one of my colleagues, a Courtly Lawn Heath proposed, which I really like, is that you can actually measure the dose to organs and tumors and then administer different doses in subsequent cycles. And I'm hoping in the future we can think about how we optimize patient therapy this way, although we're not there yet. Uh, but hopefully you'll be able to enroll in a trial someday like this. We also have interesting studies that you see at combining PRT with pembrolizumab. Uh, so this is in well-differentiated G3 neuroendocrine tumors, uh, and we've seen reasonably good responses with this uh, therapy, and we're hoping to see uh, if we need to move forward into a phase two study, uh, randomized to actually see if checkpoint inhibition can improve uh, patient outcome. There are other studies. This is uh, lutetium satyreotide or JR11, OPS202. This is an antagonist, so different than dotatate and dotatoc, uh, which has completed phase one studies. I'm not sure exactly where the development of this compound is, but hopefully we'll enter phase two studies in the near future, because there is promise in this having increased uptake, particularly in patients who have lower uptake on dotatate PET. And I think the most exciting aspect of neuroendocrine tumors right now in the trial setting is alpha particles. Uh, so 
lutetium decays by giving off a beta particle, an electron. It takes about a thousand electrons to kill a tumor cell. An alpha particle is much bigger. It's the size of a helium atom instead of an electron. And it takes two to five alpha particles to kill a tumor cell. So it's possibly more effective in treatment. And so here's a, a report of patients treated with lead to 12 dotatate and showing pretty good responses. So this is very exciting. And so we look forward to this as it enters into phase two studies. And then there's a similar compound, actinium-225 dotatate. And this is retrospective-ish data out of India where they treated patients uh, with actinium dotatate. And these were mostly post-PRT or 18 of them were post-PRT, showing pretty good response rates, 63% overall response rates. And I think there's a lot of excitement in the community seeing these drugs go into phase two or phase three trials, hopefully leading to approval uh, in the coming years. So in summary, uh, somatostatin receptor PET is definitely the best way to localize disease in patients with neuroendocrine tumors, although it's important to remember that CT and MRI really drive our ability to evaluate response. PRT using lutetium dotate is definitely an effective therapy for patients with neuroendocrine tumors, although we have a lot of work to do. Hopefully I highlighted some aspects of that, but uh, in terms of optimizing this treatment moving forward, and hopefully maybe during the question and answer period, uh, we can discuss that further. So I just wanted to thank a number of the people who've uh, funded my research over the years and uh, look forward to talking live in the near future.